Hello football fan base. Well done to everybody turning up over Easter. We really supported the team ever so well. These are the kind of games we all do it for. We do all the hard work to bring ourselves three points away with four games to play. It was a punishing reminder of what the clinical finishing really looks like. But dare I give some remaining hope to the dreamers out there? Yes I dare, because I'm a dreamer too. Three games to go. Welcome back, thanks for giving me a third or fourth try. If you're new, my name is Neil Allison. This is my notebook about Kov. Ooh, it's all kicking off right now. The Easter playoff resurrection lasted all of three days. We had the high and euphoria of the comeback against Birmingham, followed very swiftly by a pretty difficult afternoon against Birmingham. And I have some thoughts and I have some questions. Let's crack on. So over 24,000 people turned up to see the big fixture on Easter Monday. It was, it was mega to see just how many people realised just how massive a game it was. Specifically from the 12 hours on Sunday evening to midday on Monday. Being the ultra cool guy I am, I kept a keen eye on the Ticketmaster website to see just how well the sales were going. And they were going. We sold out the East Stand and then the North Stand did this on the Monday. Needless to say, I overshot the requirement to get there early by quite some order, but it filled up quickly and by kickoff, visually at least, it was kind of hard to understand how we were 8,000 away from capacity, as the only gap seemed to be over by the away fans. Kind of begs the question how we'll ever get to 32,000 again, but no point getting too excited about that. And my favourite moment of the day was in actual fact, the removal of the boil sports ad banner slash tarpaulin thing from each of the corners to be replaced by actual human being people. And yeah, I know it wasn't a proper comment on boil sports as a company, but it was nice to see the prioritization for once. Seeing this all hyped up for a big match again did get me thinking. Personally, I've never had a problem with the Rico, both as a stadium and as an idea. Honestly, Highfield Road was great. It was fun, but it was also old and pretty small. I don't say this too loudly, but it was starting to smell quite a bit of wee. Obviously the nostalgic part of me, that guy who pines for the Mega Drive and pops by Computer Exchange as a little treat, he loves thinking back to that era. But for new me, the Rico, CBS, sorry, serves to represent the size of the club we are, or if you don't believe that yet, the size of the club that we should aspirationally look to be. After all the damage that the last 10 to 15 years have done up until the modern day, and how we've lost so many fans due to apathy, and distance. It was always going to take something pretty special to fix it and bring people back. Monday was another perfect sign that Mark and his team are doing just that. So we got the jumbo attendance that we wanted. There was huge anticipation. This was the game between a promotion chasing team and a playoff chasing team. Two very good teams. It was going to be terrific. And we weren't flat. The crowd and the team appeared pumped to do some winning, but it was the familiar but which unfortunately revealed itself again. We lack in a couple of crucial areas and a lot of time this season we've actually got away with it because we are just so relentless in the fact that we continue attacking. We do, we, we don't really give up. But Monday was the day where we were shown what it would be like if you actually revel in the smallest of chances. To be to be clear, this isn't an outright criticism of the team. We're far beyond that being needed. We know where we are, they know where they are, and where the improvements are needed. And amazingly, I've managed to rationalise what was quite a bruising and punishing defeat in pretty much the same way. Or maybe I buried the emotion to make myself feel better. Sometimes it's hard to tell. But in the first half, we did exactly what was needed performance-wise. It was intense and lively. It wasn't flat. We were competing in a hugely high tempo and high quality championship game. The main difference between us? Finishing. Of course it was. Going down 1-0 was undeserved. It was also a kick up the arse to go again, and we did that. The second goal, that was partially our doing. Certainly there were things we could have done to prevent it. Rosenheim figuring that out would have helped, but even so the finish had a huge amount of luck about it, and it left us in real trouble. And in a difficult place to know how to reply. Because this wasn't Birmingham or any of the soft teams in the league, this is Bournemouth. They are, in my view, the best team in the league. Pound for pound. Don't come at me. And given what they've seen of us in the past couple of years, annoyingly they know that they are better than us. And then the kill a blow of a third made what was already an almighty task basically insurmountable for us. And for the first time this season, I think Mark settled for keeping it that way, rather than pushing our luck and making things loads worse. Look, if we'd had too much desperation in the second half to find a goal, that could have left us very open and basically primed for a battering. In any other circumstances, the introduction of McFadden, Kelly and Waghorn would probably be seen as the blandest selection of subs ever, but, and it's hard to admit this because I still think we're brilliant, it was needed. Bournemouth had elevated 
elevated their performance to a place of total control. They'd brought on the world's greatest footballer, Philip Billing, unverified, and were pretty much sauntering their way through the rest of the map. Yeah, we could have thrown on the kids, but we were at great risk of losing by more if we had done that. And not because we can't trust them, but because we simply had to stabilize. And Smart Mark knew that, which is a tough call to make because I know plenty of people will have seen that game as the end of the playoffs but it's not Mark's job to think in that way this wasn't a cup game goal difference still matters Hamer still matters he did the right thing he steadied us as best he could but left an element of hope on the pitch to try and grab a goal obviously on this occasion there was no mad comeback only the reinforcement that clinical finishing might be the difference this season I also don't want to labour the point too heavily proceeds to labour the point heavily but we all know we should have scored more goals this season. And of course, that feeling of regret means that there's a strong chance it could cost us. And by cost us, I mean something that many of us would argue we deserve, in a way. So excuse me for a second while I break out the PowerPoint and try to illustrate with some entertainment numbers, stats, just how creative to a point we've been this season. Also, just how we stack up against everybody else when we say, oh, we've missed plenty of chances and we've been wasteful. Sorry to mark, by the way, this is, these are just numbers. I'm not slagging you off at all. So if you take a look, only Fulham have had more shots than we've had this season in open play. So let's think of those as opportunities that we've worked up ourselves to have a shot and goal. On the face of it, that's really impressive. But as we all know, there's more than one way you can look at that story. So you have to dig a little bit deeper for some additional context. For a start, all shots aren't made the same. Some shots are tame, some shots are wild. Some are from Todd Kane's left foot when he has absolutely no right to be shooting. Sorry, Todd Kane. So the XG for open play, aka expected goals, which I agree is an incredibly broad idea and loads of you will think that as a stat is flimsy. But even so, for the purposes of this, it helps us understand whether we're just madly shooting every time we see the goal or if we do actually create some good stuff. The number droids are opt to back this up and say that our XG in open play is the fourth highest in the league, aka we create lots of highly scorable chances. As you can see, Fulham and Bournemouth are way ahead on this measure, as you'd probably expect. Then there's a jumble of other teams below that, and we're close to topping the pack of those, aka we're as good as anybody at creating chances in open play. Again, impressive. But then after those really impressive stats, then you move to look at actual open play goals. And we take a little bit more of a tumble down the rankings when you see those. So while we've still scored plenty and should be really pleased with that, and I am, it really does highlight the extra opportunity that's been there for us this year. Our quality of play has been so good that we've been able to create chances for ourselves as well as the very best in the league. But unfortunately, those impressive numbers don't align to the end result. So if you just take a look at the versus XG column, aka what does our goal scored number look like compared to how many goals we should have been expected to score. When you look at that number, it really does validate the anecdotal evidence that we've all felt this year. We create, but we don't convert. Just for completion, let's extend that context a little bit more. You can think of this table as the unlucky group of teams, depending on how you want to interpret it, aka these are the teams in the league with the highest difference between expected goals and actual goals. There's no further context needed beyond that to kind of push the point any further. Over the course of the season, you can tell that these are the clubs that will look back and feel that they should have done more or feel that their results didn't quite match their performance levels. I know we have the tag as overachievers this season and in the context of budget, there's no argument with that statement. We have no right doing what we're doing compared to others. But in the context of our actual players who are better than our budget suggests and the quality and opportunity that has been present throughout the course of the season through our own good play, there's a pretty strong argument to suggest that we might miss out even though our players were actually capable of doing more to a team getting lower than it feels it deserves. And excuse that phrase, it's not as easy as just saying you deserve it because you feel like you played better. But does it make 11th in the championship a fair reflection of our actual performance? Maybe, but it's hard not to rue the opportunity if that's where we end up, that is. So home truths are never uh, nice but it's not new intel so we shouldn't be surprised by it but on the more optimistic and positive side it's pushing the end of april we have three games left and are still only four points off the playoffs this is amazing this is what i wanted and i love it and it's still not as wild a chance as you may think with of course the huge if being if we do our job so for the purposes of this bit, we will assume that we do our bit. The other portion of reality that we could do with believing in, everyone else can't and won't do their bit as well. So the likelihood of two teams going out there and winning three in a row, they won't get all nine points. If we were to do it as well, is very, very slim. It's going to be very hard, but the goal right now isn't the final number or even to win three in a row. The goal is to extend hope for one more game. That's it. That's all it's about. We can't control the rest. We can't control what they do. But what we can do is give ourselves a chance. So step one, we're at a point now where for the first time this season, we can mathematically be knocked out of the playoff race. 
We've given it a really good go, but I'm not ready for that to happen just yet. And not to teach you how football works, but the only focus for me right now is simply winning on Saturday. Because if Sheffield United win, we know that is the only thing that we can do to keep the dream alive. And what it will do is it will take us into a two-game shootout with everyone else. Ignoring Middlesbrough for the moment and hoping that they don't win their game in hand. The permutations are so varied, I could spend hours fiddling with how we might do it. But what I will say is the fight is still on this weekend. And if you don't believe me, just head over to the, a football predictor and knock out a few results and see where it leaves us. I managed to get Blackpool into the playoffs when I did it last night. It's not going to happen, but if they still have a chance with the calculator, there's got to be a little more fight left in us too, with four points to pick up. Prediction at this point, I saw a Telegraph article saying 71 points. I'm thinking 69-71 is going to be the final number, which is really low, and which will probably make me feel worse if we don't make it, but... I still prefer being here than not. So that's all the excitement that's going to happen this weekend. Uh, just to rattle off a few of the funnier things from the last week that have made me chuckle. Obviously, you've got the celebration of the decade from Callum O'Hare, who, if the man does nothing else in his career, he'll be able to dine off that moment for the rest of time. Great assist. Whoever loved the glasses at him, that is an assist and a half. Fair play. And for him for having the awareness and ego to actually put them on. Superb stuff, Callum. Absolutely love it. I also enjoyed Dom Hyam joining the growing headband gang that we've got going on. An inexplicable number of current COV players who have been left karate kid during a match. Of course, I don't find the head bang funny, the thing that caused it, but pulling together a group photo was, was indeed great fun. And was missing a few people. Did Jamie Adam get a smash on the head? I feel like he did, but I couldn't find a photo of him. And <laughs> and finally, my most favourite thing on social media over the last week was Mark Robbins whistling like a champ against Birmingham as he and Vi Rash and the rest of the coaching staff were trying to get hold of Todd Kane. <laughs> Typically, I took that too far and created the following. This way, a tad. No, he doesn't want to let them get too far ahead of him here. No, no, It'll no. Be a race on. No, take the, he's taking the pressure off there. They'll slow up. Fair play me, that is brilliant. Okay, we are notebooked out. I hope you're still feeling pumped for the final three games like I am and you've shaken off the Bournemouth result. Feel free to be cool and calm about it if you like, but I'm telling you now, if we beat the Baggies on Saturday, the playoffs are massively on again. Cue immediate defeat to West Bromwich Albion. Thanks for joining again. I promise these will get better. I'm still learning at the moment. I'm still playing about with things. The subscriber numbers are rumbling away quite nicely. Please do give me a like and subscribe if you've got this far into the video. I have to apologize for the begging, but apparently it has to be done. And I have to have absolutely no shame and Ask. which given how I have loads of shame leaves me in quite a difficult situation but I have to make the Allison millions somehow so I will continue to ask take care farewell and the very fondest of regards thank you